love to chalk tango. That was um, Filter, um, Take a Picture, um, off their second album. Good song, which I was murdering. Um, and if you're wondering what that's about, uh, the uh, Awake on My Airplane stuff, uh, the singer of the band got drunk on an airliner once and started taking his clothes off and then he didn't remember um, doing it, so he wished that someone had taken a picture of it, uh, and that's why it's called Take a Picture. Anyway, um, so vaguely to do with airliners, which is um, why I stuck it at the start of this, because um, there is a new airliner available for Microsoft Flight Simulator, which we're going to have a look at. So um, without further ado, let's get to it. OK, so here we are looking at the um, new 737 Max for Microsoft Flight Simulator. This is from a developer uh, called Bredock 3 d um, you might pronounce it differently from that. Apologies for that. As far as I'm aware, they're Italian. Could be wrong about that. Um, now, um, whatever, I'll spell it for you. B R E D O K 3 D. Um, so, like, like an E D. Um, anyway, it's in the description for the video. Um, so, first thing to first thing to be aware of: um, the paint job that you can see here does not come with the aeroplane. It comes with one paint job, which is a Boeing livery. There are um, already quite a few freeware liveries out there on places like flightsim.to. Um, there is a paint kit for it, which means that you can get the thing into 3D programs like Blender and paint it in 3D. Or alternatively, you could open up the textures and, and paint them in a 2D program like t um, Photoshop or paint.net or something like that. So you could do it traditionally, or you can use that 3D method. Um, the livery that you can see here is my uh, air hauler uh, virtual airline livery, uh, Indian Trader Air Cargo, hence the uh, chalk registration number on there, and hence the um, the um, sponsorship thing on the side, Spirit of Bessie Coleman. I always name my planes in my uh, my virtual airline after fam famous um, female aviators or aviatrix, if you prefer, and Bessie Coleman, in case you didn't know, was the first black female um aviator in the united states she was the first black woman to get a pilot's license in the states anyway so um something slightly different about this model in comparison to most models that you get for flight sims is that the developer has bought in a 3d model um it looks very very similar to one that is available on turbo squid if you're into sort of 3d modeling you'll be familiar with turbo squid if not um it is an online library of 3d models some of the stuff that you can get from there is free some of it you have to buy in this case uh this looks very similar to a 737 max model that you can buy off turbo squid it might not be but it looks very very similar to it so uh, as far as I'm aware, the developers did not make the the model of the virtual cockpit and the exterior model. Uh, I think they bought it in and then um, then made it work in the flight simulator. If I'm wrong about that, then um, then apologies, but I'm pretty sure that's what that what that is what happened. So um, there are it's a nice model overall, looks pretty good, but there are a few issues with it, um, which I will clarify. Um, First things first, it sits a little bit high for a 737 MAX. Um, 737 MAX has um, the new Leap engines on it. Uh, they're the ones that were causing problems and uh, the MCAS uh, stuff that was going uh, a bit bonkers and causing crashes uh, last year um, that caused the aeroplane to be grounded. Um, the Leap engines are much bigger than the um, CFM engines that were, you typically found on a 737NG. Um, the thrust line was a lot lower, so they had to increase the height of the landing gear, gear a little bit in comparison to the NG. But I think the landing gear on this is a little bit too tall. Um, I could be wrong about that, but it looks a little bit too tall for me. Um, so that's one thing that I think is slightly iffy on the model. Not desperately bad, but um, it doesn't look quite right to me. Uh, another issue is that if we look at the fans on the engine, um, they are the wrong type of fan for the Leap engine. Uh, the fans on the Leap engine, um, the, the sort of crank halfway down the fans, uh, on the Leap engine, I think it's it's at a different angle. It might even be the other way round, um, if I remember rightly. They look a bit more like a, I don't know, maybe a Rolls Royce um, intake fan. Um, they're not they're not correct for the Leap engine. Anyway, doesn't matter once the engines are running, once the blades are spinning, you you can't really tell. So it's not the end of the world. 
but it is um, something that's slightly incorrect. Um, if you're a fan of wing flex, you're going to be disappointed because the wings do not flex on this thing at all. Um, it doesn't look terrible when it's flying along, but you know it'd be nice to see those split scimitar winglets bouncing around a little bit on this thing. But it's a twenty quid model, so you know I'm not going to not going to complain too much about that. Um, a rather glaring error on it, however, is that if you if you get the um, the ATC window up um, and we go to ground services, I'm not going to do it on here. But um, what uh, what happens is if I request the baggage service, what will happen is the sim will send out some baggage trailers um, to the airplane and it will open the cargo doors. It'll open the forward cargo hold and the rear cargo hold. And if I did that, you'd see that there was a problem. Uh, and the problem is that the cargo doors opened outwards on this model that's not right for a Boeing 737 the cargo doors front and rear on a 737 open inwards um, you turn a little handle you push in and up uh, and they hinge upwards inside the airplane and they go up on a little bungee cord um, uh, they open outwards on an Airbus A320 so um, it, it, the way these doors have been modelled on this, the cargo doors um, they're opening like they would on an Airbus A320 not on a 737 it's not the end of the world but it's not correct um, there is another slight issue which is if you call for a ground power unit um, the ground power is connected to um, a socket near the nose landing gear um, again that's where the ground power connector is on an Airbus A320 on a Boeing 737 um, it's about two feet below the um, co-pilot's window on the side of the plane so it's kind of in uh, that side area there um, sort of halfway between where the side window is for the pilot and the landing gear door um, it's not on the underneath bit again not a massive big deal but there you go anyway what I am going to do is I'm going to swing the view around the other side so you can see that the other thing that opens in addition to the cargo doors is if we ask for the jetway to be connected Manchester ground sexy thing 3241 could you please connect the jetway to the aircraft we'll see the jetway move sexy thing 3241 the jetway is going to be connected and hopefully what we'll see is the doors open. There we go. Forward door, rear door. Um, they open. Now, normally you'd only see the rear door open on an aeroplane when um, there are some steps up to it. Normally what happens is when um, you put rear steps on an aeroplane, the reason for it is, is either to let the cleaners on when it's on a spin or um, if it's being fueled, if an aeroplane is being fueled, typically what you'll do is you'll put steps on the back as well as the jetway on the front so that if there's a problem when it's being fueled, you can evacuate people from the front or the rear and preferably both. The only time you won't see that is if there's a wind warning in place because the tail can move around a bit and you don't uh, want a set of steps up against the fuselage um, with the tail being blown around and what have you. And the other thing is that when you put the steps up to an aeroplane, um, what you normally do is once you've got the steps steps there you uh, you go up the steps and you knock on the door to the cabin crew to let them know that there are actually some steps there um, so that when they open it um, they're not going to um, they're not going to sort of like you know trip up and fall out um, so normally when the uh, when the doors open like that you would normally see um, one of the cabin crew stood in the doorway if there weren't any steps there just to prevent passengers from falling out and stuff like that because um, it's quite a way down it doesn't look it but it is quite a drop um, from there now you can see that there is a little bit of the area inside the door modeled um, and that's true for the uh, the forward door as well um, there is no cabin modeled on this thing um, so if you maneuver your camera in past the sort of entrance curtain at the front or the rear there is no cabin um, uh, not the end of the world. There is an interior modelled for the cargo holds, the front and rear cargo holds. It's not 100% accurate, but it's not far off. Um, but of course, those doors open outwards on this model when they should really be opening in. Which what we're going to do is I'm going to get rid of the uh, jet bridge. Could you please disconnect the jetway from the aircraft? And I'm not sure whether we'll still be able to see that the doors open. Possibly depends on how fast the door closes, but. 
you know, no, beers to it, which is what they would do normally anyway. Um, there you go. This this airport, incidentally, uh, that I'm using here is not a default airport. This is a payware add-on. It is the Maca Sims um, Manchester Airport, which is um, very nice. Not 100% accurate, but it's a work in progress. They've said that. Um, and even at this stage, it's pretty good. Um, um, it's accurate in most respects. Um, there's a few bits that aren't 100% accurate on it, but generally speaking, it's pretty good. Um, and I should know, because I've worked there for years. <laughs> anyway, um, so, exterior model, there are some issues with it. Nothing terribly bad. I don't mind it, you know what I mean? And the 737 is one of my favourite aeroplanes. You're not going to have the cargo doors open most of the time so you know that doesn't really matter once they're short who cares which way they open inwards outwards whatever wing flex mm, it'd be nice to have it but it's not the end of the world that it isn't there the engine fan blades once the engines are running you can't see that they're um, not particularly accurate and once you've taken off and the gears retracted you can't tell that the gear was maybe a little bit longer than it should be so once the thing's flying along and you're looking at exterior models apart from the fact that there is a not any wing flex on the thing it's actually a pretty good model and it looks great in the sim um, and it paints really easily and it looks nice with a lot of liveries because it's a Boeing 737 and the Boeing 737 is a really really pretty aeroplane now um, one of the things that people were complaining about with this um, and one of the reasons why I, I bought it and thought well I'll try and give it a fair review is I saw a lot of people slagging it off saying oh i don't think much of the virtual cockpit and that was people that hadn't actually bought the thing they were just looking at a few pictures of it and going oh, i don't think much of that um now i saw those pictures before i bought this and i thought well, that doesn't look that bad to me but i'll buy it and i'll have a look so let's have a look inside the thing so i'm going to go in the virtual cockpit now i'm not going to lie to you i've seen better virtual cockpits than this but i've seen a lot worse virtual cockpits than this as well and this is actually a fairly accurate model of a 737 um, Max cockpit. It's not 100% accurate, but it's not that far off. Everything's more or less where it should be. There are things like the FMCs are not, uh, the CDUs for the FMCs are not exactly like they are in a 737 Max. They look a little bit different in the real thing. Um, and some of the switches are not the correct switches for example uh that switch down there for the floodlight should be um a switch similar to that type there um for the uh for the wiper blades because that's a that's a boeing switch and down there um that floodlight switch there that's an airbus switch um so are we that bothered not really um so there are some inaccuracies in it but you know it's not terrible you know the the rear you know where all the circuit breakers are is pretty good you know and everything's sort of more or less in the same place you can see the texturing on the seats pretty good um the the pedestal is uh is pretty good and reasonably accurate the throttles are good and all that kind of stuff um the pfds are good um, so I don't think it's that bad, uh, and the the overhead um, is almost exactly like um, <laughs> the real uh, 737 Max. It's not identical, but it's it's pretty damn close. Um, now that's one thing. Um, the other thing is how much functionality is there on this thing? Well, for a kickoff, this thing, the CFB on the side does nothing yeah it does display the rudder trim um but um it's not any sort of electronic device it's not going to display anything or anything like that yeah so um that's kind of just for show um as far as i'm aware the windows don't open um but then again you know you don't open the windows that often on an airliner anyway um the only time i ever saw people opening their uh, windows on a 737 when we were on this stand was when we were shout, uh, getting on the headset to uh, to the cruise and saying can you get us a brew at your galley and what they would do is they'd get them uh, to get a brew out and they'd open the window and then uh, they'd hand it down to us we'd usually back a truck up or something like that and stand on it so that we could reach the window so yeah so yes you do do occasionally open the windows but yeah 
not really, you know, not that often anyway. Um, there you go. Um, so, switch wise, um, let's see what what does function now. Um, most of the <coughs> upfront control panel, multifunction display, MFD, whatever you want to call it, this thing, the the old big sort of thing across the top with all the autopilots. Most of that works. Not all of it. Most of it. Um, so. All of this stuff where you can switch between standard barometric pressure and put in uh, different pressure readings on there. You can have it in um, hectopascals or millibars and all that kind of stuff. So that thing works, yeah. Um, these switches for swapping between map and VOR and plan and all that lot work. These range switches on this thing here and the traffic button work on there and the center button works on there. And all of this stuff works as well where it says terrain and position and uh, and data and airport and waypoint and weather and all that kind of stuff. All that works. Um, the, um, the warning lights um, and the cancel button um, that you, you hit to sort of acknowledge that there's been a warning. That works on both sides. Um, and that works on the other side as well. On the main uh, MFD autopilot panel, the course buttons don't do a hell of a lot. Um, flight director works. Um, auto throttle works. There is a gotcha on this auto throttle. I will just point this out to you. You'll notice that the auto throttle was on. I didn't switch it on. It loaded with it on. What that would mean is if I pushed this aeroplane out and then started trying to use the throttle um, to taxi it, uh, I'd get a big fat nothing. So remember when you load this thing up, boom, disconnect the auto throttle. Probably get a warning on that. Yep, caution. That's telling me that the uh, the auto throttle had disconnected. So you can see that that thing does actually work. Uh, this indicated airspeed and the dial to adjust it. Um, that works for the auto throttle, as does the little button where you switch between uh, a uh, Mach percentage and uh, knots. Um, speed, thrust mode, and FLCH all work on it. L nav works, V nav works, the heading um, control works, and the selector for that works. The heading hold works, the approach button works, the localizer button works. Um, v nav, I think I've already said that works. Uh, the altitude hold button works, the vertical speed um, button works, uh, the altitude selector works, so you can change the altitude. Vertical speed and the little wheel to adjust the vertical speed works as well. If you put vertical speed in, you can see that that's working. Um, so no problem with that. The autopilot engage buttons, both of them work on there. So you can hit both of them uh, for an ILS approach. The disengage button works, the flight director button works. Um, on this side, the course knob doesn't work either. Um, but all of this little FS panel works there. So pretty much everything apart from the course um, buttons on there works and you know the course since you are usually um, setting up the ILS in the FMC it's not the end of the world that the course button work doesn't work um, so moving down here the the little swapping the ICAS panels on there works the little plan button or map button works there is a menu on here where you it repeats what's up on that little FS panel so you can have airport display waypoint display stations position data for left for right uh, weather radar and terrain radar on there uh, the terrain radar I think goes off at 3,000 feet I might be wrong on that at which point the the weather radar will kick in and give you that display uh, there's, there's a couple of other, other bits and bats on there as well if you have all that stuff on that thing's going to be cluttered to hell um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn all that stuff off uh, and we'll close that so you know I can flip between there and flip between there and you can do all that stuff on this side as well so you can flip that one if you want to you know you can come up here uh, and and change those things so you know you can change stuff on the other side as well if you want to for example I might choose to have the uh, that's thing you know have that on there on on a different range so I can follow that for taxiing but then maybe have the flight plan on this side you can see all the sort of engine gauges and stuff there and what have you not got the engines running standby altimeter works gear there is a little bit of a glitch on that it's giving me green lights for gear down yeah if I put the gear up you, should, you might see this when we have a bit of a fly around on it those don't go red now I'm pretty sure those do go red on a 737 max when you raise the gear um, they stay green on this there is a little uh, gear check thing on there landing gear check check where you can see that the, the lights are working on that thing but it doesn't go red um, I might just possibly 
be wrong on that but I'm fairly certain that those lights go red when the gears up on the 737 max you've got uh, your auto brake stuff working there um, those incorrect buttons that are Airbus buttons on there they do actually work uh, there you go right so uh, what else works on here um, not all of these buttons work yoke visibility you can, you can see that they've been assigned to different stuff on there you know and, and a lot of them are yeah they're buttons but they're their, their yoke visibility buttons rather than uh, than what they actually would be. Um, since we are going to do a takeoff, I'm going to put that on rejected takeoff. Uh, so we're ready. Speed brake lever works. Uh -huh. Flap lever works. Or you can use it with the uh, keyboard shortcuts. If I put, I'm going to put five degrees of flaps in there. We should get an enunciation for it on the the panel here. Uh, with a bit of luck, um, might have to sort of move that out. Oh, uh, yeah, oh yeah, there we go. Um, now, um, what I am going to do is I'm going to mess around the FMCs in a minute, but we'll skip past them for the moment and we'll have a look at the central pedestal. Most of this is for show. A lot of it does not work. The FMC works, so you can use the FMC down there if you want to. And at the forward end of it, you've got the little fuel um, fuel valves to run the engine they do work because you can do a proper sort of engine start on this thing but the vast majority of this thing you know like fire handles and things like that um, not um, not anything other than just sort of visual a problem if you um, go on VATSIM and I know someone's spoken to the developer about this so it might change but on VATSIM you would want ATC to assign you a squawk code and then you would want to be able to put it in uh, and the problem with this is that the TCAS switch is there and the squawk code uh, for the transponder do not work now that doesn't mean that you're stuck with a transponder on 7000 because we'll see if I bring up the ATC window what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to clearance here and I'm going to request IFR clearance Now, what they've asked me to do is they've asked me to squawk 0756. They also told me uh, that my initial cleared altitude was 13,000 feet, so I've put that on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to respond. Now, I can't manually key that in, but when I read back my AFR clearance... Sexy thing tree 241 cleared to DeGaul Airport as filed. Take off runway 23 left climb and maintain 13,000 feet. Departure on 118.775 squawk 0756. Boom, it goes in when I read back. Sexy thing tree, 241 read back is correct. Contact ground on 121.705 when ready to taxi. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, the squat code does go in if you are using the default ATC, but you can't manually put it in. That would be a hindrance to using this on VATSIM. Uh, unless they could kind of work some way around it and what have you um, but yeah that could potentially be a problem um, now then uh, on the overhead I've said that you can do a manual start for this thing and you can or you can do a control E start if you want I've got ground power on at the minute um, so I've got that little switch there which gave me ground power but what I could do if I wanted to is I could start in this thing set it up so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the position lights on uh, and I, I'll, I'll put the anti-collision beacon on uh, just for a bit of a laugh uh, <laughs> like that now obviously what you can see is the uh, fuel pumps are off so I'd want to get those on like that. and then what I would want to do is I would want to crank the APU and then what I would want to do is I want to want to make sure that the um, battery is on and I'd want to make sure that I'm on the 
right settings here with the APU and what have you and I've got the correct voltages up there and then what I would want to do is I would want the APU bleed on boom like that uh, and then what I would want to do is I would want to crank the engines with this thing here and I'd want to get the the fuel flow on now if you don't want to do all that you can just hit and I'll do it here control E you can see both engines are going on now yes I know that you would never normally start the engines on the stand you'd normally push the thing back uh, and then you crank the engines uh, when you got off the stand but since we're in a flight simulator I'm not really worried about it but what I'm going to do is just for some realism I'm going to put the uh, and to make sure that I've got my strobes and, uh, and anti-collision lights on and all this like you can see this things lighting up now strictly speaking yes I know you put the strobe lights on when you go on the runway you put the anti-collision beacon on when you're cranking the engines but you know uh, I'm not going to worry about that too much uh, now obviously what you would also do is you can see we've got flight and continuous ignition and ground and what have you so you can faff around with this the other thing that works up here which is kind of cool is the wiper blades work so if I put that on I can put it on really really high speed um, you've got that there you go they do not actually wipe the raindrops off the windscreen but um, it kind of looks cool anyway uh, for that sort of thing so we're cranking up the engines there uh, and you can see they're both up to speed there like that so we're doing okay um, I could have could have done a manual start if I don't wanted to. Uh, another subject of manuals, this thing comes with a manual. It's not massively comprehensive, but it does explain how to work the FMC and it does explain how to do a manual start. So if you're not familiar with one of these CDU flight management computers, don't worry, the manual's got how you do all that stuff in. It's got a little tutorial in it and what have you. So let's have a look at what the FMC does and does not do. Now this flight that I loaded, I started off uh, Echo Golf Charlie Charlie, i.e. EGCC, at Manchester Airport in the UK, and I set up an IFR flight to LFPG. You saw that when I was doing my IFR clearance, um, and it's got some waypoints in it. So this is the default flight planner in Microsoft Flight Simulator, and I've done that. But initially, what I want to do is I want to put my position data in there. So reference airport, uh, Echo Golf. Charlie, Charlie, um, boom, and it's in there, and we are at gate 49, so if you want to, you can put the gate in as well for super duper accuracy, gate 49, boom, like that, or if you want to cheat, you can just go where that GPS is there, boom, that'll put that in the scratch pad, and then you can put it, boom, set IRS position, now, of course, on the real thing, you would be going up here, and you would be faffing around with all this stuff, and putting the uh, the INS in and keying all that in and switching all these align buttons and all this kind of stuff and what have you to do that. None of that is functional. None of that at all. Yeah. So all of this stuff back here, um, it does nothing. But then again, aligning the uh, the INS or IRS or what have you um, is uh, is a pain in the ass anyway. So you know I'm not bothered that you don't have to do that. <laughs> so back on the FMC um, we've got uh, the reference airport in uh, and we go to the next page there you can see FMC position RMP actual blah 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 like that GPS GPS uh, navigation inhibit if you want uh, and uh, we've got all that stuff on there now what we really want though is we want to go to the index bit there uh, we've done the position bit um, so we want to do the perf page performance yeah um, so cruise altitude 39,000 feet cost index 100 you could change that if you wanted to um, but the only thing you really need to do on here is put some reserves in so let's just put anything in 12 that'll do there we go um, like that. and then what I want to do is I want to go back to the index and I want to set the I can faff around with the thrust limit I want so you can see we can have select climb 1 on there or we can have climb 2 if we want and we can faff around with that and do reductions and all that kind of stuff um, but really what I want to do is I want to sort out the takeoff now I put the flaps on 5 if you remember rightly so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put 5 in there so that we're tallying with the FMC and I've got 5 degrees in there uh, and then what I should now be able to do because I've filled everything else in is I should be able to um, get the the V speeds by clicking on the LSKs at the side at line select keys boom so I've got V1 
I've got V rotation and I've got V2 speed on there like that. And once they're in, I'm over here and you can see V1, 110 and the other ones will be up here when you're accelerating. It does give you the audio call outs for that as well, by the way. Um, so back on the index page, like that. Uh, we've got all of that stuff. So the only thing that we need to set out now is the departure and what runway we're going off. And to know that, what I need to do is I need to call for taxi in this Manchester sim. Manchester ground, sexy thing, 3241 with Mike ready to taxi IFR. Sexy thing, 3241. 23 taxi left. Two order, runway, two tree left using taxiway golf. Julia Hotel, cross runway, two tree right. Hotel Victor Tango. Contact tower on 119er. Decimal 405, when ready. So I need to acknowledge my taxi clearance. Boom, like that. You'd normally call for that when taxi you were hold, actually on the taxiway, but there you go. Okay, so departure and arrival page on the FMC. And it told us that we're going 23 left. So we hit departure on there and we choose 23 left there. Now, if we wanted to use a standard instrument departure, a SID, they are all here. Manchester Airport off runways 23, it would normally be a Monty or a Pole departure. Um, sometimes a Listo one and what have you. They're the three common ones that are on there. Um, there are a couple of pages of stuff on there as well. Um, they're the really common ones. Um, anyway, um, now we've got all that set up. It is asking me to execute this stuff. So I go boom like that and then we're in business. Now, um, if we look on the route page, You've got there, Origin, Echo Golf, Charlie Charlie, um, Destination, um, Lima, Foxtrot, Papa Golf, i.e. Paris Charles de Gaulle, uh, and we've got the listing for the route on there. So if you wanted to start screwing around without and adding extra ones in, you could, you know, if you want to, if we're looking here, if I, I don't want to go by the Trent VOR, the TNT VOR, I could hit delete down here. Uh, and then what I could do is I, I could click at the side of this and it would delete that thing up or I wanted to add something in there and if I've changed my mind about the performance because I've seen the route on there and you know a different thrust limit then I can go and hit that um, now um, the what I would normally do when I've got all that set up is I would hit the progress key on there um, and I'd see that you know um, my first waypoint uh, is Romeo Oscar Delta Oscar Lima and it's 16 miles away when I turn direct to it. It might be further away if I was using the standard instrument departure. And then after that, it's the Trent VOR. Uh, and it's 321 miles in total to LFPG, um, top of descent. Um, so we're all pretty good to go there. Um, I'm going to get that out of the way, like that. Um, and let's light up everything. So. I know you shouldn't put these on first, but we want to see what they all look like. So let's get everything hanging out, yeah? Because one of the things that is decent on this is, there you go. So you have got a dome light in here if you want to do night flights. If you want to see what that looks like, let's check it out, yeah? So here we go. It's night time. There we go. And if you want to see what it looks like at night outside, there you go. Uh, anyway, we don't want to be. <laughs> so what we'll do is go back to a bit of daylight. I'm actually recording this late at night, so when I hit live, it went night time. I forgot about that. <laughs> right, uh, so this is all pretty much all right. The only thing that I would want to do is uh, I would want to make sure that I'm on the either the APU generator or one of these generators here or something like that and not on ground power. Um, not everything works on this. Most of it does. Yeah. So we've got external power off. Um, I'm not actually plugged into anything, but you wouldn't want to be pushing back with uh, with a, a ground power cable still connected. It's been done. <laughs> um, anyway, let's, let's get this PFD looking a bit more like what we'd actually want. So uh, let's go with plan um, and let's roll the view out a bit to 
don't know, 20 miles or something like that. 5 miles, 10 miles, 20 miles. Right, let's ping that over. There we go, we can see our route. Yeah, so we're coming off there, and then we've got Rodol and then TNT. Yeah? Uh, and we're heading sort of, it'll be approximately 160 degrees, something like that, i.e. the direction of Paris from Manchester. So, uh, oh, almost forgot. Boom. You got a heads up garden system, yeah? Um, not collimated, so, you know, it's not going to be super duper realistic. However, um, it is kind of useful. The only thing I will say about it is um, it's not particularly bright um, against white clouds. It could do with a bit of a colour tweak, I think. But then again, I have my brightness of my clouds up quite high. I might see that. Um, obviously, what you can do is you can sort of adjust your view up and down to make that a little bit more useful if you want. So anyway, let's go on the external view and let's push this bugger back. So. pushing it back now normally I use um, FS2 cruise um, pushback Express because it's great because you can drive the tug yourself and stuff like that um, but I'm just using the default one here um, so there you go and I want the parking brake off as well which I've just done with um, the keys assigned to it I'd love to see this push Tug really pushing it back off this stand. What now? I've got both engines running. <laughs> Have you ever find yourself on this stand as well? Um, just past where it says 49 to the left of that truck that's parked under there. There's a toilet in there and a drinks machine. <laughs> now, normally off this stand, where you push to is you push back and then you turn to the left. Um, and you get the nose wheel in line with the next stand along um, and that's where you stop that's the tug release point for this stand um, I'm not going to worry about that too much I'm just going to push straight back and then stop but you know that's the nice thing about um, FST Cruise Pushback Express you can drive the thing to exactly where you want um, and do realistic pushes and stuff like that but um, I'm not going to worry about that too much you can see where it's asking us to taxi to um, 0.62 miles away uh -huh. so we'll do that now ordinarily like I say you'd turn that push to uh, to the next stand along uh, 51 or whatever um, yeah that would be your tug release point then the, the, the you'd call for taxi and then you'd taxi um, forward to where that 50 marker is that we're just passing and then you'd turn there and go that way or possibly down um, past the control tower depending on what um, what sort of taxi clearance they'd give you so uh, I'm gonna knock that push on the head so I'm gonna hit that and I'm gonna hit the parking brake and let that thing go away uh, um, we've already got our taxi clearance and we've got all our taxi lights on and stuff like that which um, ordinarily this would be the point where we'd be turning them on and we'd be giving the uh, pushback um, tug crew a wave off to, um, and they'd be saluting us telling us that uh, they'd removed the um, bypass pin from the landing gear and closed the little door on the side which is a pain in the ass to close on the 737 got three little um, three little sort of like press studs on them and sometimes they jam <laughs> so if you ever see someone at the side of a 737 that's just pushed out and they're faffing around at the side you know what they're doing they're trying to get the little press buttons working on the side <laughs> Right, so the tug's well and truly clear. Like that. Um, keep in mind what I told you. Yeah, make sure that the auto throttle is off because if the auto throttle's armed and you try and taxi with the auto throttle on, when you move your taxi, uh, when you move your thrust lever, it's not going to do anything. So we've got the thrust up there. I'm gonna release the parking brake. And I'm going to do a bit of a tight turn. Now you can see here that the animation for the steering wheel uh, at the front is not very large. Now, 
But this add-on is not alone in being like that. Um, most of them don't have a particularly accurate animation of the nose wheel on there. Um, so I'm not going to complain about that too much. Now if we go in the cockpit, you can see that the rudder pedals move. But you can see that that control handle moves as well, the steering tiller. Now you can't click and grab it, but it does actually move, which is kind of cool. So here we go, taxiing to the runway. Now at this point, normally, ATC would either be telling you to taxi or telling you to hold short um, of here before you went over the runway. And obviously what you do is you have a bit of a look to the left and the right anyway, regardless of whether ATC told you it was all right to go across. Because um, you don't want another Tenerife on your hands. <laughs> Um, so that's all looking good uh, so at this point what I would normally be doing is I'd normally be making sure that the FM's the, the um, upfront control or MFD is is kind of set up properly so I'm going to give it a good old 220 knots ish for cruising like that 13,000 is our cleared altitude. I would normally put the heading on the same uh, same line as the uh, as the runway, or more or less on the same line as the runway, um, just as a backup. You know, if you needed to go on heading, you know, I don't know your your steering wheel fell off or something like that, or what have you. So I normally do do that, um, just as a bit of a precaution. Flight director's on. We've got these things more or less how we want them. Got no warnings on it. Obviously, if it was a real flight, we'd be doing the, you know, like, um, briefing the co-pilot and saying, yeah, if the wheels fall off, we're going to do this, and if the engine sets on fire, we'll do this, and what have you, and all that kind of stuff. Now, there is the whole point for 23 left, so we want to stop there. Uh -huh, and I'd put the parking brake on and we'll get the uh, do for up and we want to contact the tower and we want to request takeoff clearance from the tower. Manchester Tower sexy thing tree two four one at runway two tree left ready for takeoff IFR to take off. That warning was the parking brake. Three two four one cleared for takeoff runway two tree left. So we acknowledge the clearance that we're cleared to take off. Cleared for takeoff runway two tree left sexy thing tree two four one. And we check the config flaps on which is what we said we were going to go for um, we might check the trim make sure that's like that uh, take off trim you know I can put that trim down a little bit if I want to you know to hold the nose down but you know I'm not going to worry about that so let's release the parking brake and line this bugger up Give it a look and just make sure nothing's coming that it shouldn't be. Not unknown in flight simulators. Not unknown in real life, actually. <laughs> now, so, <coughs> we'll stick the brakes on, and what I'll do is alter the position so that is on the horizon. We've got a sort of more or less realistic view out of the cockpit. Um, and we should be able to see the V-speeds on that. So, um, hold it on the brakes. Get a little bit of power up. Let both engines spool up. We'll have a look outside. So you can see, it doesn't really matter that the fan blades aren't accurate once the engines are running. Uh -huh. Go back into the cockpit. Um, I pressed the wrong button there. <laughs> there we go, let's get that. There we go. Looking good now. Um, 
And off we go. Now, if I was doing all the sort of proper piloting stuff, I'd be 80 knots and cross-check on the other one to make sure that it's that airspeed alive and all that kind of stuff. And then we're getting the V1 call in a minute, which we got there. And then we're at rotate, and we are at rotate speed now. I've got the external view, and away we go. And that's definitely a positive rate, so we get the gear up. Uh, and then I'm going to come back off the throttle a little bit. And there she goes. And you can see. And you can see that thing flies pretty nicely. So do you mind just center on? Manchester Center Sexy ah. Thing Tree 241 is at 800 feet, climbing 13,000 feet. Sexy Thing Tree 241 Manchester Center, continue to run down as planned. Right, so they're giving... So they've given us uh, continues to road all, which means that we can hear L nav and V nav. And they've given us a uh, straight up climb to 25,000 feet. So let's get that on as well. Uh -huh. Overcooked it a bit there. There we go. 25,000 feet. Now. How's uh, the co-pilot being lazy there? <laughs> Acknowledged. 25,000. Now, um, we are coming up uh, to 200 knots, so I need to start getting those flaps in. And obviously, we don't want taxi lights on. And stuff like that, and we'll check the altitude that we're coming up to, 4,900, coming up on 5,000 feet, so we'll keep the uh, keep the landing lights on until we get up above 10,000. You don't have to, but, uh, hey -oh. now, obviously, yeah, I can keep this hood down if I want to, I can get that thing out of the way, because you only really need it for, uh, for IFR, uh, sorry, IMC, on a, on the, uh, the runway when you're taking off, and, uh, um, see conditions for landing. So here we go. Let's have a look at what this thing looks like in the air. There you go. Um, flies pretty nicely. Um, got those, those lights on and all that lot. Looks pretty good. Now you can see no wing flex on the thing. But other than that, it looks pretty good. So let's get back in the cockpit. Uh, and you can see there. That thing is hopefully merrily lining up <coughs> to turn. So you can see that that thing's turning. So hopefully what it will be doing is it will be doing an LNAV turn to that. Now you can see that airspeed indicator 30 knots and that's because I haven't got the probe heat on yeah so you could say probe heat there now notice those switches don't work so make sure in your sim that you've got a key assigned to it now I've got P assigned to it and I just pressed it and now my airspeed indicator is reading properly like that so slightly annoying that you can't Flick the uh, flick the probe heat on there, but you know, as long as you've got a keyboard shortcut, you're all right. That can work. Yeah? Um, don't need the APU bleed on anymore. Um, do we need engine bleed on? Not really. No. Uh -huh. Can't do any of that stuff uh, with the uh, the sort of you know fly altitude and landing altitude and stuff like that. Can't do any of that, which uh, which is kind of important, real life for, 
for sort of pressurization and things like that but um, and it's part of the um, pre-takeoff flows and what have you so you know there are some things that you can't do but you know not the end of the world all right get me altitude I've passed 10,000 feet so we'll get the landing lights off which we don't really need them on like that. And you could I guess if you wanted to turn off the APU but since we're not paying for fuel we're not going to worry about it too much now they did give me um, a different altimeter setting of uh, 3030 but since I'm above 10,000 I'm going to keep it on standard anyway so you can see on there 29.92 which is standard but I can hit boom standard on there like that. and it would put it on there anyway yeah so uh, I'm not going to worry about that too much um, and there we are in the clouds and that has tracked a road all so it's got rid of the last thing on there and now it's tracking to towards TNT so you can see there progress boom like that and then it's coming down the list to the next one so now I go to the legs there top of the legs page is TNT not Rodol anymore like that. boom from Rodol to TNT so you can see that this thing does work being up um, if you want to and you can have that on there where you can have it flying down the route or you can have it like that uh, where it's pointing to it um, and since I'm now more or less on course and my average course is going to be about 150 to 160 what I will do is I'm going to change my heading selector to the the sort of average course for that, which is normally what I do when I'm flying. Um, so that, you know, if things go horribly wrong and I have to come off VNAV, then I can hit heading hold uh, and I'm heading more or less the right way. Um, uh, ordinarily, what I would do is I would have this on fairly close range where I can see the, um, the next waypoints. Like that. and then on this thing here I'd have more of a kind of overview of uh, of the thing at long range on that one so let's see if we can do that that's a bit there we go 320 yeah so I can see those waypoints there um, getting uh, like out to France because the uh, the distance is about sort of three or four hundred miles so uh, so we're more or less all the way to Paris there um, like that. And, and there you go right so I'll just have a bit of a check on this all right flaps are definitely up speed brakes on auto throttle is armed um, flight directors on um, we're cleared up to 25,000 feet blah 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 we are getting kind of near that all the lights are um, where we'd want them to be we are squawking the code that we're supposed to be squawking um, so there you go at this point on my airline this is where I would be going ladies and gentlemen this is your captain speaking smoke them if you've got them because you can on my airline <laughs> um, there you go look on the external view uh, um, and she looks pretty good in the air yeah no doubt helped by my beautiful paint job um, there you go <laughs> oh, there you go um, so that's it um, it's 20 quid 22.8 euros which is like I say 20 quid 19 pounds 75 if you want to be strictly accurate um, which I think is going to equate to about $20 um, so you know um, convert it to whatever currency um, it is in your country but $20 20 quid 20 euros you know it's all pretty much for muchness these days um, and some people like I say were slagging off the virtual cockpit saying it doesn't look that great it looks all right to me you know it's not fantastic but you know it's not terrible um you know i would prefer it if more of the switches worked on the overhead but <coughs> i'm inclined to think 
the, the amount of people that have bought this and the sort of traction that it's getting, I'm inclined to think that it will either be modded or patched to have that occur. Um, it would be very nice for people that use VATSIM. I don't use that that often. I've used it in the past a few times. I don't use it that often, but for people that use VATSIM and things like that, it would be nice if this thing worked where you could put in your transponder codes. I think that is kind of like something that would be fairly important um, uh, in terms of whether some people would buy it or not buy it. Um, so I think that's our clearance past 25,000. Uh, knowledge instruction and uh, let's blow through to 35,000 now since not everyone wants to fly in real time one of the things that you might want to know is how does it fly on accelerated time? So let's do it, shall we? Now, um, so I've got keyboard shortcuts of page up and page down for accelerated time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit page up a few times. One, two, three, four. And you can see that that thing is cheerfully going along it. All right, so we're going to hand it off to London. Um, I was just looking at the um, at the stopwatch timers here um, because it's it, one of the annoying things about this flight simulator is it doesn't tell you what time acceleration you're on, so you can hit you know accelerate time a load of times, and then when you want to decelerate it, you're like, mm, well, am I actually you know on normal speed here, or am I going a little bit faster, or what? Uh, <laughs> like that. So uh, 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 thirty-five thousand. They're on there. I know they're going to clear us to 39,000. I know you wouldn't do this in real life, by the way, but I'm going to put it on there because they'll give us clearance to 39,000 anyway um, when we're going over London. And we're going to be up to 35,000 shortly anyway. Now, if I was getting a little bit concerned about the speed and stuff like that, um, obviously what I could do is I could go for manual vertical speed on there. Um, what I would want to do is, if, if I wanted to do that, is you know, start hitting the speed on there. Now, if you can't get this speed working <coughs> on there, be aware that you're going to have to turn that on as well, and you're going to have to hit that for the intervention and what have you, and then you might have to put it on Mac rather than not and use thrust or use speed. But all of this stuff works, so you can do that if you want to. So if you want to want to come off LNAV and VNAV, um, and you don't want to use, uh, you know, VNAV speed <coughs> you can do that, you can do level changes and all that kind of stuff if you want to so yes, it doesn't do everything but um, it does enough for if, you, if you're if used to flying 737 NGs like PMDG and iFly, you're going to know what you, you you won't even need to read the manual to work this thing it'll just be, oh it doesn't quite do that one so I'll do this instead that's, that's essentially where you're going to be right, so tune for London Centre um, since we're going to be coming up to 35,000. Sexy thing tree two four one is climbing through flight level tree four zero for flight level tree five zero. Go on, blast us up to 39. Sexy thing tree two four one London Center continue to wellness plant. Come on, baby, give us 39. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Don't make me descend. There we go. <laughs> ah, you got to love it when you're at 34,900 feet and they give you clearance to keep going and you, you still had it on uh, on massively high vertical speed. Ah, 
the ATC in uh, in flight simulators. It's nothing if not predictable. Uh, but there you go. Anyway, I'm not going to fly this all the way to. Uh, I'm not going to fly this thing all the way to Paris. Um, suffice to say that it will do um, an ILS approach. Um, perfectly fine. Um, but it does actually fly nicely manually. You saw that when I took off um, and I had it sort of like um, going straight and whatever. There was no problems with it or anything like that. It flies really nicely, in fact. Um, so, would I recommend it? Well... How much do you like 737s? Um, if you are happy enough to be flying the included default Airbus A320, there are a lot of mods for that that are making it very realistic. So if you're not that much of a Boeing fan, then you might be um, might be happy to just stay with the Airbus A320. <coughs> you might also consider that for an additional 30 quid ish i.e. the 50 pound mark in about three weeks there is the aerosoft um crj uh 700 i think it is a crj 700 it might be the 550 as well um coming out um and that's probably going to be a little bit more super duper realistic but then again the CRJ, crj doesn't have an auto throttle um whereas this thing does so if you like your auto throttles and stuff like that bear that in mind but for an additional 30 quid you can get something that's probably going to be um a much more realistic airliner it's certainly going to have a much more you know pretty virtual cockpit but if you like your airliners and you like the 737 max um or the ng because the 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 ng is uh, is very similar looking to the max if you like like those uh and you've got 20 quid to spare and then uh yes i do do recommend it yeah it's good fun to fly uh i could say um i take the point that people are saying that you know the virtual cockpit is not the best but in all honesty looking around i don't think it's that bad at all i think you know i've seen a lot worse um and i think it's okay now um uh, could it be improved yes could it have some more of the switches working yes would i like it to yeah absolutely you know what i mean but um i think for 20 quid it's great fun um and um, good for for uh, sort, of, sort of videos and visuals and stuff like that because you know apart from the apart from the sort of like fact that it hasn't got wing flex it's very it looks very very pretty in the air yeah I know the uh, the cargo doors open outwards rather than inwards like they should um, and yeah the the fan blades are you know not a hundred percent accurate and stuff like that but these are fairly minor things and you know they may even get fixed in a patch anyway um so for i think for 20 quid you can't really go wrong now there are a lot of reviews out there that are saying oh it's a scam and all this got because it it uses default gauges um and, and some people have even suggested that you know oh because it's using default gauges they're stealing them off a of sobo or microsoft now i've never heard such a load of crap in my life yeah nearly every add-on aeroplane um ha uses some default stuff from a flight simulator nearly every single one of them yeah uh some more than others yeah and you know people have been saying oh yeah it's using gauges from the the boeing 787 and that's in the super premium deluxe version um so they're distributing stuff in that's not in the state what a load of crap yeah that stuff is in all versions it's just not unlocked in your standard versions and your middle inversions and what have you so um and it, it, this thing's going on the microsoft official market and the the one from the from the same developer that also did that which was their um Eurofighter typhoon was also using gauges um from uh from stuff like that and that one's on the microsoft official market as well so and people are saying oh they've stolen stuff and and wait while microsoft and asobo find out about that they're just talking through their arse yeah so just don't believe that stuff um 
Uh, so I wish the I wish these developers good luck. You know, yeah, you got to start somewhere. This is the second plane that they've got out, um, and not even with a full SDK, and it's twenty quid. And my personally, my hats off to them. Yeah, you know, not everyone's going to like it. Some people, oh no, I'm waiting for a better better VC. Great, you know what I mean. Nobody's twisting your arm up to your back to buy it. But people that are criticising this. Um, particularly people that are criticizing it without having bought it um, really they, they need to get over themselves it's 20 quid you know you can't go to the bar and buy a round of drinks for 20 quid these days <laughs> and and what other ad on an airplane can you get but you can pay more than that for uh, some airport scenery <laughs> Who are you? it's like you know I just don't get it you know I mean it's like yeah 20 quid so um you know feel free to disagree with me if you're like no no Al, you don't know what you're talking about um you know, you know you're entitled to your opinion but i think for 20 quid it's got a lot of promise um it'll probably get patched or modded and improved and stuff like that um and i don't think you can go wrong for the money um uh, so there you go anyway um that was um chocks hanger um and he yeah i said that i'd be uh that i'd be mentioning some other stuff as well um so um be aware that there is a um new um replay tool out for uh microsoft flight simulator today i've got that i might do a review of it next week uh it's pretty good it's it's got a few little gotchas in it but you know that's pretty good um and there is uh, the Aerosoft CRJ, which allegedly is going to be out in about two, three weeks' time. Um, so I'm definitely going to review that one as well, because um, that's another one that's going to be contentious like this. Because, um, you know, flight simmers, they love to slag things off, and, uh, you know, they love to slag off Aerosoft for some reason. I don't never quite get that, but, you know, lots of people do. Um, so I'll do a review of that as well. But um, uh, for now, uh, that is your... Um, Bredock 3D um, Boeing 737 Max um, she flies in the new Microsoft Flight Simulator like she is doing in the real world and let's just hope that the real 737 Max has, uh, has got beyond uh, the problems that it was having last year uh, you know it remains to be seen I still think you know the 737 Max is pushing an old airframe a bit too far but, you know, I would love to be proved wrong on that. And, um, you know, it's a pretty looking aeroplane. I'll give it that. So, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll be, uh, I'll be proved wrong on, uh, on thinking that, uh, that they're, they're pushing the airframe a bit too far. You can see there, it's, uh, it's hitting a little turn. So this thing is hitting El Nav and Nav. I don't know which one we're heading for. Let's go back in the cockpit and see. Uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, just hit, just hit another one there. Uh, we're going to uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. let's see. Give me my my progress. Uh, we're we're going from big to tiger, big tiger. Uh, anyway, um, oh, accidentally put the gear down there. No, I don't think you want to be <laughs> doing that at this speed. Now it's going to give me the warning clacker. There you go. So you know that the uh, the audio warning for the clacker works didn't intend to do that and show you that but you know there you go that would be my landing gear doors ripped off uh, anyway look out for the next um next chucks hanger video which uh, i'll be out probably next week um and if you you like what you see check out some of the other ones as well um and hit the subscribe button if you want and hit the notification bell and all that bollocks or don't <laughs> um, or if you want to slag me off in person you know you can send me an email or put something in the comments going oh you're talking bollocks or you can go and find me on uh, go and find me on avsim and flightsim.com and places like that you know uh, or, and, you know if you've got queries about this and all that lot you can PM me and what have you and all this sort of thing and you know send me uh, foul language and say I don't agree with you or what have you and all this sort of thing I'm always up for a bit of a fun discussion on things like that uh, if you want me to you know review stuff make suggestions as well anyway everyone take care uh, and keep uh, keep wearing those masks and uh, hopefully we'll be uh, we'll be out of, uh, uh, out of this mad pandemic stuff by uh, 
by a few months time you know by the middle of summer with a bit of luck anyway stay safe everyone stay cool cheery bye